Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, November 19th, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And writer Y. Tran Bui. Hey, everyone. So it is officially Thanksgiving week. Uh, I should say now that we are going to be off, uh, at least on the podcast, on uh, Thursday and Friday. Uh, celebrating the nation's holiday. Um, and um, we, uh, yeah, so you won't find podcasts. Uh, you'll only find podcasts on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We will have some news updates running on the uh, on the site on Thursday and Friday. But, um, yeah, we'll see you after these three days. We'll see you next on the next Monday. So, uh, but let's jump into the news. Let's start off with what happened over the weekend, and that is that Fantastic Beast: The Crimes of Grindelwald came out. And uh, how, HT, how did it do at the box office? Is this like still a big hit for Warner Brothers? Is this still like is Harry Potter still their like savior? Well, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald technically did score the number one spot at U.S. theaters this uh, weekend, but it fell a bit short of Warner Brothers' anticipated estimates, as well as um, the overall performance for Harry Potter films in general. So it raked in an estimated $62 million at at the domestic box office, making it the lowest grossing opening for a Harry Potter movie ever. So it may not be the Warner Brothers golden child anymore, but it still did really well internationally, raking in $191 million uh, from 79 markets, uh, making it a $253 million global debut. And they're supposedly making five of these movies, so three more Fantastic Beasts movies. And it seems like both critics and fans are kind of upset over this latest one. HD, I know you haven't seen this yet, and you're a big Potter fan. Yeah, I've been nervous to watch it, just because I think I will very much dislike it. Yeah, my my girlfriend, Kitra, walked out of the theater visibly angry. Like, she was angry. She was, like, so upset um, about, you know, not over things that happen in the movie, but over, you know, the movie itself actually existing and, you know, decisions that were made. Yeah. Um, so I like, will say, oh, yeah, I will say I really liked the, the first, actually, well, I didn't really like it. I enjoyed the first Fantastic Beasts, uh, at least the first half of it, in which it was mostly Newt's Commander and the, like, more simple, cond- like, condensed Fantastic Beasts story. But when they tried to tie it into the uh, the rest of the Harry Potter universe, it just became bogged down by all this world building and mythology that didn't really cohere. So I get the feeling that the oh, second HD, one... You're, you're going to hate this movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to see Newt's Commander like, travel the world and meet cute, you know, magical a- animals. I didn't want this whole... World War Grindelwald thing. It's I have enough of that. I don't need it. <laughs> and uh, Ben is just going to continue pretending like this movie doesn't exist. This yeah, franchise, blissful right? ignorance. That's <laughs> my game. <laughs> do, do you think like? Do you think that the box office is, is going downhill enough that it might make them change their plans for a five movie franchise or? Do you think that's like solidified? Because I mean, there is a lot of merchandising. There's you know theme parks. There's a lot that rests on you know the success of this franchise for for them. Yeah, I think while uh, the box office has been stumbling for the Fantastic Beast movie, I think that Warner Brothers is just full steam ahead with this franchise. Like they already have those five movies planned out, and it's not enough of a box office disaster to uh, you know stop the universe entirely, like Dark Universe per se. So um, I think that they will keep going because this film is still performing really well internationally as well. And as long as it has that international hold um, and fans will continue going to see it, it will probably just, we'll probably get more of these movies, whether we like it or not. I know it's too late, but I wish the JK Rowling could write like, you know, the big books on these movies. And then we could have a, competent screenwriter adapt them <laughs> into a movie yeah that's what that's what i wish but uh i guess it's too late at this point <laughs> um yeah let, let's move on to netflix uh last week a story that we didn't get to 
was a hit after we had recorded, is that the producer of Castlevania is planning on making a Devil May Cry TV show that will connect the two in a multiverse. Ben, what is going on here? Yeah, so last month, Adi Shankar, who has produced a bunch of movies over the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, basically he teased online, I can confirm that I'm working with an iconic Japanese gaming company to adapt one of their iconic video game series into a show. And that uh, a lot of people were, were wondering if he was talking about making a Legend of Zelda TV show. And it turns out that uh, on uh, yeah l- l- last week on Friday, he announced that he's actually working on a Devil May Cry show, which is based on the long-running video game series. And that he said, I've acquired the rights to Devil May Cry myself so that the jabronis in Hollywood can't fuck this one up too. Devil May Cry will join Castlevania in what we're now calling the bootleg multiverse let the speculation begin. You can read into that all you want. So that's all the actual information that we have. So uh, over the past few years, uh, Adi Shankar has produced a bunch of movies that he calls bootleg productions, which are like fan films that deal with, uh, you know, recognizable characters. Like he brought Thomas Jane back to reprise the role of the Punisher in a short called The Punisher Dirty Laundry. He did one called Truth in Journalism that had to, had to do with Venom. He did uh, an animated Judge Dredd short. And uh, there was one that uh, I think it was Joseph Kahn directed a hyper violent short film about the Power Rangers. Uh, I think that was in 2017. So you know, that that's probably why he's calling this the bootleg multiverse. But yes, as you mentioned, it, it's Devil May Cry and Castlevania. And Castlevania, is, which has just been renewed for its third season, is an animated show that's on Netflix. But we're not even 100% sure that this Devil May Cry show is going to be on Netflix. It, it, I mean, that's like what I said is literally all the information that we have at this point. So it's like we don't know yeah. who's going to be in it. Uh, you know, exactly how it's going to connect. I'm wondering if the reason that he used the term multiverse instead of like a shared universe is because this could potentially be streaming somewhere else. So it'll be left to fans to sort of draw the connection between these two properties. I'm not sure how exactly these things could cross over conceivably, because I I think they take place in drastically different time periods and parts of the world. But uh but Who Ben, knows? at Maybe... least the jabronis in Hollywood can't f it up. So right, yeah, exactly. So uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe uh, maybe hardcore video game fans who have played both of these. Uh, games and are you know deeply deeply familiar with the intricacies of these franchises uh, have already I don't know maybe somebody knows something out there that I don't and are are drawing these connections but you know from the outside looking in it's it's sort of tough to see how this is actually going to work. Yeah, you know I played the original Castlevania for Nintendo Entertainment System, which probably has nothing to do with the animated series, which I know a lot of fans and critics actually enjoy. Like it's actually uh, people like it. Uh, but I never played Devil's May Cry, and I know, Ben, you also haven't, but writing that up the correct. story, you kind of, uh, you know, did some research into it. What, what is Devil May, uh, Devil's May Cry? It's it started in, or started in uh, 2001, and it, it's basically it follows a demon hunting mercenary slash vigilante named Dante, who is out to get revenge on all these demons for killing his mother and corrupting his brother. And there are a lot of references to uh, the divine comedy by Dante Alighieri, which is an old school uh, Italian poem that uh, basically sent its protagonist through various levels of hell. Like if you've heard the phrase circles of hell, that's where that comes from. Um, So uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I watched, I embedded a trailer in the slash film article and it's, it's a game that is very, um, it's super stylized and it, uh, deals with uh it's a fighting game a third person fighting game that deals with um tons of action and combo moves and stuff like that so <laughs> i mean i'm not even sure how you turn that into a property by itself let alone connect it to castlevania which is about like monster slaying warriors and dracula <laughs> so I, I don't know what's going on here hmm see like, i don't know enough about either of these properties but i do think it's interesting that there is a producer in Hollywood buying up properties and just like being like, yeah, we're going to mash them all up into their own cinematic universe. Like that to me, it might not equal you know, good entertainment, but that to me is interesting in a way. 
yeah, I, I guess, you know, you got to give him credit for trying. And uh, who knows, this could turn out to be like a, a really cool thing that is like perfectly smoothly incorporated from one show to the next. And, and all of this, you know, works out wonderfully. And, and it could uh, he could add more properties to this quote unquote bootleg multiverse. So I, I don't know, this could be the beginning of something really cool. I'm, I'm I just I'm very interested to see how it, it actually is going to work in practice. HD, do you have experience with either of these games? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Are you interested <laughs> in a bootleg? Uh, what, what is it? Boot. Bootleg. Bootleg universe? multiverse. Bootleg yes, multiverse. Yeah. I don't know. That, I don't. I... I don't like that term. <laughs> <laughs> I am not at all. I'm sorry to say, I do not really know these properties apart from what I've written up about the Castlevania trailers. <laughs> so I. This is not for me. I don't think it, it is kind of an anime, right? Of sorts. Yeah, it's an, it's definitely um, animated in the anime style. So like that yeah. kind of piqued my interest. But I don't know. I just I everyone has their own and like the anime fans yeah. have their own like favorite kind of, of genres and stuff. And it's not really for me. Yeah. So I guess um, unless he gets the rights to Kingdom Hearts, which I don't see happening <laughs> because of uh, Disney's there, end up touching. There is a Kingdom Hearts manga. <laughs> So it's possible, but also it's like the goofiest manga ever, and I don't know how well it would translate because the storyline is ridiculous and convoluted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on to an, another story. Over the weekend, uh, while I was away, Brad covered this for the site, but basically Disney held a press event celebrating Mickey Mouse's birthday, which he, it was his 90th birthday on Sunday. I was actually at Disneyland for that. Um, it was insane. Uh, by insane, I mean the large crowds waiting hours in line for, you know, exclusive limited edition cups and stuff. Wow. I, I did not do. Um, I was there to enjoy myself. Um, but um, anyways, <laughs> back to the news story. Uh, they basically announced a bunch of stuff for upcoming Disneyland and Disney World stuff, uh, including Galaxy's Edge, the new Star Wars land that is coming to both uh, po uh, both resorts. Uh, one thing that they released is they released a video of John Williams uh, recording the score for Batu, the, the the world of Galaxy's Edge, which is uh, kind of surprising that he's back to return and record a score. But I'm I'm kind of wondering, like, are you going to be walking around Batu and like the John Williams score is just going to be playing on loop, or is there going to be like like I, the the song is actually pretty good. Uh, I, I recommend you check it out on slashfilm.com. But I feel like. John Williams needs to record like an entire sound like, you know, we need a whole album for, for it not to like just, you know, play on loops. So I'm, I'm wondering where exactly the score is going to play. Is it going to play in one of the attractions? Is it going to be like, you know, you're walking around this like, you know, galactic alien world and, you know, this is just playing in the background. Uh, Peter, you know this more than I do, but I, I remember walking around in theme parks and there being, you know, hidden speakers embedded in certain areas where you just are walking around and music is playing naturally. Am I remembering that yeah. correctly? Does that happen? Yeah. And it, it, okay. it changes and they even have like transition points in some parks where like where you're going from one land to another, there are speakers that basically are able to kind of crossfade the song so it's a, like a, a uh interesting transition from one land to the next um but uh, i don't know i'm just curious to see where this john williams score lands in the land and uh you can listen to that on com. the other things they announced for galaxy's edge was the millennium falcon ride they fi finally has a name it's called millennium falcon smugglers run which sounds like you know a book that might have been released in Star Wars Legends. Uh, it, it's fine. Uh, they also did reveal... Uh, they had this a teaser trailer, which is also on Slash Film. I'll link it in the show notes. Uh, that shows kind of the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon that you will board with five other people and you will control the Millennium Falcon. Unlike Star Tours, you'll actually be in complete control of this uh, vehicle as it goes on a mission. And uh, they, they did reveal that there's 200 controls in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon that will actually be used by the people in there. And I, I, I don't know. I, I just am very skeptical that many of those... Wait, 200 controls? That, that's... So if there are <laughs> six people on the yeah. thing, that's 33 buttons per person, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I just don't feel like those are going to do anything. I feel like there's going to be a whole bank of buttons that does one thing. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's going to have to be very simplified. 
Uh, I'm very interested to see how this turns out. But if if you see if, if you see that video, like it 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 looks like the Millennium Falcon. Like all those buttons and you know those switches and everything are there. Um, they also announced that the dark ride. Uh, which we've talked about before in the past, uh, which is going to put you in the middle of a battle between the Resistance and the First Order. It now has a name. It's called Star Wars Rise of the Resistance. They revealed this uh, trailer for it, which I think was filmed actually in the ride. And aside from the horrible direction and bad acting, it looks like the set of a Star Wars movie, guys. <laughs> it looks pretty incredible. It looks like an Imperial Star Destroyer. Uh, they revealed that the ride is going to feature over 50 animatronic stormtroopers. Um, that's kind of exciting for me. And uh, they also uh, talked about the Star Wars Hotel, which is going to be coming after you know Galaxy's Edge opens in Florida. They um, they showed some new concept art of this, like, a launch pod that you're actually going to like board to board the hotel. So it's going to like take you to the hotel. And they also said that there's not going to be any windows in the hotel at all. It's all going to be like screens, you know, showing you, you know, space and Batu and, you know, whatever. Um, so that's uh, pretty interesting. A hotel without windows in Disney World. Um, they, they also had a, a, a lot of other announcements for Disney World, including new uh, fireworks shows, uh, some some updates on the Mickey Mouse and Ratatouille rides. I'm not going to talk about them here because it's probably too much theme park stuff for uh, this film and TV podcast. But uh, you can read Brad's write up for it on Slashfilm.com and linked in the sh- uh, in, in the show, show notes. Um, let's move on from theme parks. To uh, to the video window. I don't. I don't have any. I don't have any transition for that. Well, well, let's move. Oh, here from, you go. Here you go. Oh, here. Wait a second. Okay. Let me let me help. Let me step in. Yeah. While the Star Wars Galaxy's Edge Hotel won't have any windows at all, let's move from that <laughs> to the shrinking home video window that might be happening. I don't know. I don't know. No, that was good. That was good. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So the, 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 the window in which, you know, movies come out in the theaters and there's a window of time before they come out on home video, be that video on demand or DVD, Blu-ray, uh, is shrinking and, uh, the studios want it to shrink even more as they always do, but it sounds like they're going to really be pushing for this next year. Then what do we know? Yeah, and the theater chains are the ones, obviously, who are or are basically their biggest competitors. There, the the uh, immovable objects at which they they always ram themselves. But uh, it's it seems like Warner Brothers and Universal, according to a new report from Variety, are going to start this conversation again. We've we've talked a lot about this over the past few years. In 2017, studios and theaters actually came pretty close to signing a deal that would enable studios to release their movies on demand just a few weeks after the theatrical window instead of waiting the traditional 90 days. Um, But that deal fell through right around the time that the Disney Fox acquisition talks started uh, happening. And it seems like everybody sort of got distracted dealing with that. So they they put this whole thing on the back burner. But uh, according to Variety, Warner Brothers and Universal are going to be talking with um, you know, the, the theaters and, and trying to get this uh, home video window closed starting in 2019. So uh, it says that they remain intent on releasing movies in homes earlier, and they're expected to re-engage theater owners in discussions at some point uh, next year. So um, we're not sure exactly how this is going to play out. It could just be a, a repeat of the conversations that we've been having before where nobody makes any decisions and it's just this circuitous <laughs> discussion that seems to go on forever. But I would think that, you know, in the changing times and with the rising of the rise of streaming and all of that stuff, somebody's going to have to budge here. And, uh, you know, theater owners, of course, they don't want... Um, these windows to shrink because they think that if movies are made available for people to watch in their homes just a few weeks after they are available in theaters, that people will stop going to the theater altogether and they'll just wait and watch things at home. And I guess they're scared because it would probably mean that they would need to up their game significantly and improve the theatrical experience, which is something that a lot of big chains are not 
invested in doing they're just sort of you know amc how many times have you gone to an amc and there's been 30 minutes of pre-roll before the actual movie has started or some idiot has been talking the whole time the theater managers won't do anything about it it's you know it's these same problems that we've been talking about for a long time so uh it's an it's an ongoing battle and it seems like the next stage of it is going to begin next year yeah, I, I've recently gotten invited to some of the Netflix screening, like press screenings here, and I've like been. I, I actually didn't go because I was like, "Oh, I'll just wait a few weeks and they'll be on Netflix and I can watch it at home." So I feel like if 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 that could be me, that could be a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, we weren't going to do mailbag on this episode, but I did want to bring up uh, one of our readers, Anthony C from Sterling Heights, uh, uh, Missouri, uh, said. That um, he wrote in basically saying the Netflix theatrical release of Roma Dilemma is very fascinating and also depressing. He he wonders if if Roma got nominated for Best Picture, would AMC theaters play that movie in their Best Picture showcase where they play all the Best Picture nominees for that year's Academy Awards? They do that like every year. Um and I, I just want to bring this up because I think it ties into this. I, I'm kind of wondering what you guys think because, I mean, they're basically doing that because they want to keep this theatrical window. If if they bow down to, you know, one film like Roma and sh- uh, show Roma in theaters and, you know, it's on Netflix, you know, a few weeks later, then – or it's on Netflix while it's showing, then they, you know, are setting a precedent that studios are going to, you know, take advantage of. Uh, so hmm. what do you guys think? Do you think – if Roma were to get nominated for Best Picture, which I'm I'm not even sure it will, but if it were, would AMC actually show it in their Best Picture, uh, you know, showcase? What do you think, HD? That's a good question. I actually have not really thought about that because it's not something AMC showcase isn't something that I yeah you know, usually like I put a lot of thought to, but um, I, I always, feel like I always want to go to it, but like I've already mm-hmm. seen like more than you know. 75 percent of the movies and i'm like i don't really need to see that one or that one again yeah i get the feeling that they won't because amc does like to kind of stand uh strong in its in its stances against like streaming in some sense and like other other competitors so it feels like this um these um discussions that take place between theater owners and theater chains and um the 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 home video release models are won't go anywhere as long as they have this sort of um you know like rigid rigid, yeah yeah, they both seem to have yeah like they're at a like a really extreme standoff at this moment so i don't i don't think so that's just like what i think i I don't really know the the, maybe the only way that they could do it is because it is in that sort of special, uh, what did you call it? A, a best picture showcase? Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's like a two day event. Usually, I think it's like a marathon event. Yeah, so maybe if it's in that, then they can sort of get away with with uh, incorporating it into that because it's not like a, a traditional kind of thing where they're they're bowing down in in a in a traditional sense. It's more like oh, we're making an exception for this instead. I I don't know. Uh, it yeah that would be an interesting thing because it's like what do they value more their stance against um, shrinking home video windows or the tradition that they've that they've set out for the best picture showcases uh, that is certainly an interesting question I wonder if if they have if they're thinking about that right now I'm yeah I'm wondering if anybody there has even yeah even thought about that when does the amc best picture showcase even take place i'm I'm assuming sometime in december or january i would think it's january it must be like man uh, the oscars move around uh a little bit every year so i'm not exactly sure when the nominations are announced but i have to think it's it's somewhere in like uh, you know within a couple weeks of when the nominations come out last year it was in january so i think it'd probably be the same case this year then so uh roma Uh, would already be on netflix at that time mm -hmm. so technically it would be them showing kind of like a movie that's out on home video which i guess like fathom events does all the time and these theatrical re-releases it's not like you know when toy story was re-released in 3d it's not like disney pulls Toy Story from video to have that kind of, 
you know, event in the theater. So I'm assuming. Right. And yeah, I guess. And then like if Black Panther gets uh, gets nominated for Best Picture, that movie will have already been on home video. Yeah. For months. It was like with Get Out um, earlier, too, because that came out like a whole year before. Like in early in the year, so yeah. definitely it was already out in home video by the time the Best Picture Showcase came out. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my stance on this. I think it is gonna be in there unless Netflix is gonna be the one that's gonna be the dick. <laughs> riling people up again. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be like, no, f you, you didn't want to show it in your theater, so you don't get it now. So it'll it'll be interesting to see if that happens. But uh, I don't know. Judging by the early uh, you know awards chatter, it doesn't seem like. Well, it really depends on how many Best Picture nominees we get this year, right? Like, do you think Roma has a chance of, of making it? I think so. Okay. I think that Netflix is definitely gunning for it. Yeah. And also, it frustrates me, too, that we have different number of Best Picture nominees every year. Just keep it at 10. It's like... Yeah. <sighs> I agree. It just makes the race uh, so much more annoying. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the next cinematic universe, which isn't uh, the bootleg multiverse of Castlevania and uh, Devil May Cry. It is General Mills Serial Monsters? Apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's going on here? General Mills, the food company behind big, big brands like Cheerios and Cocoa Puffs, apparently wants to launch its own cinematic universe for its monster cereals. So that includes Count Chocula, Frankenberry, and Boo Berry, all based off of classic movie monsters such as Dracula, Frankenstein, and a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, they uh, launched a website called We Work With Monsters that put out the call for uh, filmmakers, actors, agents, writers, Hollywood in general, to help adapt serial monsters to feature films. Um, it doesn't seem like a pra- practical joke. It seems like they're genuinely asking for Hollywood movies, movers and shakers to help them um, establish this cinematic universe, why they decided to do it through this website. I'm not sure. Maybe they don't have any Hollywood uh, connections yet, so they're just doing it in the most public way possible to get as many headlines as possible, which you know helped, worked actually. So um, yeah, this might this might be happening. So, do you think this is serious? <laughs> like, I I mean I'm unsure, but it seems like the the website is uh, taking submissions for ideas. Uh, it has a big header with um, Frankenberry, you know, in a, a, a very sultry position. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I have no idea. I mean, it's possible that it's just like one big um, sort of stunt uh, to promote the serial, but it's possible that that's what they're um, they're intending to do. I just I I don't know like these I, I know you already said that these characters are just based on you know the classic uh, monsters which mm-hmm. have already been kind of told on the big screen from the Universal Monsters. And I, I, I don't see how they could do this. Also, I, I know in the past, like, there has been stories of, like, uh, studios trying to get uh, movies made of, like, the Keebler elves, for example. And I, I've talked to a lot of people in Hollywood that it's actually very hard to get a movie made based on a... Um, a product tie-in character because you uh there's a lot of laws having to do with uh, appealing to children and also like you know what could be promotional material in a movie i don't know there, there there's a lot of weird like lines and stuff so i, I don't know i like ben would, would you go see a universal i mean a, a general mills <laughs> serial monster cinematic universe I mean, I don't know, Peter. I don't know about that. I, the thing is, the you know, you were talking about, like, how these characters are based on the classic Universal Monsters. The Hotel Transylvania movies already exist. And, yeah. and those are, you know, that's an ongoing franchise that basically, uh, I don't know, takes those same characters and puts their own spin on them in animated form. I, like, would these be live action? Would it, would it be animated? Would it be... 
uh, <laughs> like a live action CGI hybrid. Like, I mean, I don't know. I, I, but... I can see it now, Ben. It's a live action CGI hybrid where these monsters come out of the cereal box at night with Ryan Reynolds voicing all of them. Yeah, and like I don't know, Robert De Niro as the the flustered guy who just wants to eat a cereal or something. <laughs> like, I, 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 there are a lot of different ways they could go with this, and I will not be surprised in the least if you know a year from now we actually see a trailer for one of these things but um <laughs> I, I don't know it, it certainly seems like they're scraping the bottom on the barrel at this point you know what i hate is i hate lord and miller because they created the lego movie and basically that is the the one example to like anything like this like you know whenever something like ridiculous comes up like you know play-doh play-doh is making a movie which they are or you know this like you know it's so easy to write it off but then there's like well the Lego movie was really good, and that shouldn't have been good. Right. <laughs> so it's like th- there might be an idea in here. If you had the right people, you know, and the right idea, maybe it could be good. <laughs> yeah. It, it b- Before they came along, it was so much easier to just be able to write everything off as, <laughs> as a terrible across yeah. the board. But I guess we have to wait and see, like, what talent gets associated to the freaking <laughs> Boo Berry movie now. <laughs> Yeah, now we'll never know. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on to our last and final story. That is that uh, YouTube has now started offering movies on their platform uh, with ads. Uh, ben, tell us about it. Yeah, so last month, YouTube quietly rolled out a new feature where there is a section on YouTube's website where you can stream a bunch of Hollywood movies for free. Uh, and the only catch is that you have to watch ads that pop up during the film. So um, I guess in a in an attempt to stand up to competition like uh, Roku and Amazon and Tubi TV and places like that, which all of those are either currently implementing or developing right now ad supported video on demand content. YouTube has decided to put 99 as it stands right now, 99 movies available on its website. And it's, you know, there's some garbage stuff on there. There's uh, Kevin James and Zookeeper. There's um, Agent Cody Banks, too. There's there's stuff that you would never want to watch and stuff that's way worse than even that. But there's also some really good stuff on here. The first five Rocky movies are available. Uh, James Cameron's The Terminator, uh, the Legally Blonde movies, uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven. I mean, there are a lot of uh, and actually um, Monsters, which is uh, Gareth Edwards first movie, this really low budget film. That's kind of a a cool way for people who uh, are interested in his work to uh, see a movie that was really, really small. This indie feature that he made for like, I don't know, twenty thousand dollars or something very small, I think. Or was it one hundred thousand? I don't remember the actual number, but (laughs) but he made. Yeah, a really, really low budget movie, and and he did all the visual effects himself. And now the movie's available on YouTube for people to just watch uh, for free. So I mean, it, this is kind of a cool thing for people. To, oh, the other one that, that I wanted to mention was uh, Grand Piano, which stars uh, Elijah Wood and John Cusack. And Damien Chazelle wrote that movie before he, you know, really made it big as a director. And the movie is insane. It's basically like, um, it, it's like Phone Booth or. Uh, one of those wild movies where it's like speed, but instead of a bomb being in the bus, there's a bomb in the piano and, and (laughs) Elijah Wood can't stop playing the piano or else the the thing goes off. Like it's totally nuts and, uh, and very much worth a watch. So that is available right now on, in this new section of YouTube. See, I'm curious about this. Like, do you, do we know is YouTube licensing these movies to do this and they're getting the ad revenue or have they convinced studios to do this and the studios are getting, you know, a big percentage of the ad revenue from these screenings. Yeah. So ad age, uh, sat down with Rohit Dwan, who is a uh, YouTube's director of product management and asked him that question. And he would not reveal the deal that he has struck with the studios and MGM in particular is, is one of the studios that, uh, a lot of their library titles are available right now. So it, it's unclear exactly what that deal is and, and who's getting what, but he did say that in the future, the, uh, selection, which like I said, currently stands at 99 movies is going to be expanding. And in the future, there's going to be the opportunity for advertisers to eventually be able to pay to sponsor a particular movie so it seems like right now it's benefiting youtube um like i said you know they're trying to to um shore up their own 
uh, competition and and make sure that they can stand their ground against these competing forces in the marketplace. Um, I, I don't know if the studios are getting you know the the raw deal at this moment or if maybe those uh, that deal is subject to change and as it moves forward. But right now it seems like a pretty good deal for customers. Or I guess you don't even have to be a customer to to watch this right now yeah. because everything's free. So that's cool. And uh, I mean, if you are a YouTube Premium subscriber, you wouldn't I guess see any of these ads. Um, yes, I'm, that's I'm, correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Rocky right now, which is uh, an hour and fifty nine minutes, and there's eleven ads throughout the film here. But from what I'm seeing, it's not like those like you know the movie stops and then an ad plays, kind of like Hulu. From what I'm experiencing, at least on my player right now, not logged in, it's like those pop up ads that you kind of like go in the bottom third of the thing and have some text or a banner and you click out of it. So it's hmm. not that intrusive. So I'm wondering, oh. uh, HT, would, would you watch movies like this? I would actually. And even with 11, you know, regular ads that interrupt the programming, I don't for an hour for like a two hour movie. That doesn't sound too bad for me. Um, I wonder how that would work out on, for example, uh, like a Chromecast or Amazon Fire, though, if you're watching YouTube through that, like, would the ad still pop up at the bottom of oh, your that's screen? that's a good question. Um, or would, yeah, I wonder if that would, if it would be able to work on, like, the, on the TV. Um, but yeah, I definitely would watch movies like that because, um, yeah, I'll take more free movies. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It, I, I'm... I'm wondering if, you know, I'm wondering how big the, the library of movies can go. Right now, you said there's like 90-something? Yeah, there's 99. And just in to answer the question about the TVs, I'll read a, a quick paragraph from the Ad Age article. It says, uh, people are increasingly watching YouTube on smart TVs where free movies could become a welcome offer. Almost 20% of YouTube is watched on TV sets right now, according to recent stats released by YouTube. And that's its fastest growing medium. YouTube even recently gave advertisers the ability to target their ad campaigns only to people watching on TVs. So it sounds like it would still work on a smart TV. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming in that mm -hmm. case, because they don't have the bottom third, at least on Apple TV, they don't have the bottom third banner pop-ups. So I'm assuming you would have to do the like Hulu kind of thing where it like shows like a 30-second ad or something. Yeah, I but, think so. But even there, that that's not bad, like, you know, for free movies. Yeah, it's probably about the same as watching something on, you know, like network TV, like watching a movie that way. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where... It depends on the, the selection, obviously, for people, because if you can watch it on Netflix, then you're just going to do it there and not have to worry about <laughs> watching any ads or dealing with that at all. But if you really want to watch a certain movie and it's not available streaming anywhere else, that's a, a really nice option. You know, I, I think I've in the past have just like really wanted to watch something and. I don't know, I've just paid my rent, so I don't want to buy it on iTunes or whatever. So I've just looked on YouTube to see if a free version is streaming there. And it's like, you know, mostly garbage quality because people, up, you know, illegally upload things. But this seems like a nice uh, official workaround to that. <laughs> ben, did you just admit to watching pirated movies I mean, online? if I'm looking for, like, something <laughs> very specific, and, and no, this doesn't happen very often at all. But if I'm looking for something very specific, and, you know, I have uh, Netflix and HBO Go and... Hulu, I think that's it right now. Uh, yeah. So if I'm looking for something specific and and it's not there, and I'm just like, oh man, it's like you know, I walk away with the Charlie Brown music playing, and I just go <laughs> to YouTube and just like look to see if there's if anything is there. If I'm looking for like a specific scene or something like that, but yeah, um, for the most part, yeah, it's uh, this seems like a, a nice workaround. I think everybody's probably done that, and I I think that's probably. Probably one of the YouTube, like, you know, convincers. Like, you know, if if this isn't available for free or cheap to people, you know, people are just going to find a way to watch it. So why not find a way to make money, monetize um, these kind of movies? Um, it, it, this could be very interesting. If, if, they, if they're able to build up a library of hundreds of movies, that could be very cool. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, th that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Ben, where can we find more of your work online? You can find me writing at SlashFilm.com, and I am on Twitter at Ben Pears. HD, where can we find you? You can also find me at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBooey. 
you can find me at slash home on all social media. You can find all the stories we talked about in today's podcast on slash home.com and linked in the show notes, um, including the, all those trailers from star Wars galaxy's edge. So if you're excited for, you know, to, to visit the galaxy of star Wars in Disney parks, you got to ch- go check those out. Um, this podcast, Slash Home Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slash home.com. We might be doing a mailbag episode tomorrow, so if you have questions for us, uh, send them in now. Um, and uh, please, as always, go to our iTunes page, give us a glowing five-star review, write us a paragraph that helps us quite helps us out quite a bit. Tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow. Now, do you think like like certain filmmakers might like start putting the clause in their contract, like Chris Nolan's, like you know, absolutely n- not. I'm not going to allow my my films to be showing on YouTube for free. I feel huh. like you can watch Dunkirk on YouTube, can't you? Well, I think you probably can you can pay for it i don't know yeah. i mean it's it's certainly not available in this library right now because it just opened but uh, that's an interesting like why do you think that they would uh say that peter like people like nolan who are well no one uh, doesn't want you to watch with... it on a big screen and like most people watching youtube i know you said 20 percent are watching on tvs but mm-hmm. the majority 80 percent are watching it probably mostly on their phone if not their you know 15 inch you know 12 yeah. inch uh laptop but th- that seems like you're, you know, at that point, Christopher Nolan would just have to be against the idea of home presentation at all, because most people are not watching stuff at home on, you know, the the home viewing experience is not the ideal way to watch it. So, I mean, I think the logical extension of that argument would be that Chris Nolan just doesn't want any of his stuff available, <laughs> at, you know, for home yeah. release. Well, and, well, and that's already too late because you can watch Dunkirk on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, well, yeah, and. But I think, like, he sees that as a necessary evil. Do you think if if Chris Nolan could have his way, he could make a movie that's only for theaters and never go to home video? Like, do you think we'll ever see that, actually? Like, do you think, like, hmm. there'll ever be an event movie that they're like, this is going to be released in theaters. It's not going to be in home video for five years. <laughs> <laughs> I know well, I'm making up ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like, I feel I like... technology. Um, that might be oh. very interesting. That might be a way to make a huge event out of a theatrical experience. Um, I feel like we should write this own, uh, you know, this question into the mailbag tomorrow and talk about it with <laughs> with everybody else. <laughs> Peter, uh, Peter Sreda from Los Angeles, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs>